Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Hey, it's Hugh Ballou again on the Nonprofit Exchange with from uh, Central Western Virginia and App- Appalachians. I think we're going to get a little snow tonight. Russell David Dennis, you're in uh, Mountain High, Colorado. How are you today, sir? It's a beautiful day here in Aurora, Colorado. We've got sunshine and just a tad under 50 degrees, which is wonderful for December. Thank you, Juanza, for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, Juanza, we like people to tell a little bit about themselves. We um, you know, always hate people introduce me and they make up all this stuff and I go, I wonder who that is. So even if I wrote it, they kind of embellish on it. So we like <laughs> people to uh, talk about themselves, a little bit about, you know, um, how did you arrive at what you're doing? What's your background? And why did you choose branding as a career? Um, well, a little bit about me is, um, I'm a graphic designer by by trade, so uh, I have about 15 years experience in graphic design, and branding was kind of like a natural maturation, uh, so as I begin to look more into, you know, what happens on the advertising end, what happens on the marketing side of things, uh, I saw some areas that I felt I could be using in and could... Um, kind of bring some clarity to as well. So many people think that when you have a logo or when you have a design, um, that that's all you need and, and that's their brand. Their brand is the logo itself. And so coming from um, the graphic design portion of things, I was able to really dig in and explain visually how there's a lot more strategy that needs to be involved in just saying, hey, I have a really nice logo and I'm, um, I'm now ready for the world. So you opened up a can of worms What here. are some things that... Mm. We seem to have a little yeah. delay. Now, little what are some things that here. a brand is supposed to do? Ah, okay. What are some things that a brand is supposed to do for an organization? What What is... Uh, what is that? What, does, what, what are some things a brand does for an organization? Um, I, think, I think Seth Godin, who, who I'm a big fan of, I think, I think he kind of said it best when he said that um, a brand, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but he says like a, a brand is the sum of the words and the pictures and the values of a, of a business or organization. So in, in, in the case of a nonprofit, that's kind of what your brand has to do or should be able to do. Uh, you you, you want to be able to kind of sum it up. Um, and, and that's something that, like I was talking to my colleagues earlier, that's something that we're, we're kind of seeing across the board is that there's a lot of organizations that have kind of like an identity crisis. They're not able to really pinpoint who they are because they do so many great things. Um, but then when it comes time to explain those great things, even to donors, they tend to, to struggle in that capacity. So it's about a big, bold promise, the, the, the impact that people get from uh, taking in the services of the nonprofit, working with them, uh, the place that people start and where you take them to. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you speak with someone and they, they, they're having a little bit of difficulty articulating that, talk a little bit about some of the things that you do to help them sort of hone that message. Uh, the, the big thing that I love to do is uh, we try to get them in and have a strategy session with them where we sit down and what we focus on is let's, let's turn your, your brand or your entity or your nonprofit into a, a physical person. And, and if that person had a name, what would that name be? Uh, where would they hang out at? What do they like to eat? We try to uh, really paint the picture for them that this is, this is someone, your business or your brand is someone that you would either want to hang out with or not want to hang out with. 
Um, and, and who do they remind you of? Even? Is it, does uh, your industry remind you of like your uncle or is it your college buddy? But uh, whatever it is, that's kind of what you want. That's, that's kind of where we begin or, or the first stage rather that we try to take them to. Is there a place uh, where most organizations, whether it's nonprofits or, or small business businesses, is there a particular place where people get stuck when they're trying to articulate their brand? Um, I, th I think for me, what I see is that they tend to want to, um, they want to they, they want to have it all they want to say that they do everything under the sun and it's very hard to get them to kind of pinpoint what their specialty is um uh, i remember talking with uh, with a couple of clients actually and um we're like okay so what what industry or what market do you want to focus on and their answer was well, we want to we want to sell to everybody and you know everybody isn't an answer we we have to be able to to pinpoint where the focus has to be so i think it's kind of getting everyone wrangled in um and and going through a format that kind of funnels funnels those thoughts uh what is it th that causes people to resist maybe honing in on the focus is are there are there common points of resistance to that? Um, I I think they're not able to. I, I think, and oftentimes we're too close to the work. Uh, we're too close to what we love, or or, or an idea, um, or or even an angle that we want to present or see things done. We have oftentimes in our mind um, what needs to happen and how it should look. And if you're not able to let go of those ideas or wrangle those ideas in until it's it's cohesive, then there tends there tends to be um, a, a lot of pushback or a lot of resistance. Uh, and and in those cases, what we try to do is uh, show where the idea is viable, to show where it's a good idea, but maybe this isn't the the best placement for it. Or um, oftentimes, maybe we can circle back and use it in a different form or a different entity. Yeah. What do you think, Hugh? That sounds a little bit like a strategy problem, wouldn't you say? It does. You know, there's, there's um, I would think, Jawanza, setting up the strategic framework for the organization, what's the problem we're solving? Where do we want to be in uh, five years? So the strategy to me is where do you want to be and how are you going to get there? And then someone with your skill set would say, okay, Let's drill down on what, what you want people to be saying about you when you're not there. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I heard, heard you say something I hear a lot when I ask people um, who their market is. It's uh, El Mundo, the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody. Well, I understand from marketers, if, that, if everybody's your market, you don't have a market. Exactly. Exactly. So why is it important to, you know, there's different parts of branding. And so... Um, let's just tell people our secret. You've just, I invited you and you accepted to join the board of the Lynchburg Symphony Orchestra. Yes. And, and um, um, I just did it on the impulse. I, it seems like you have some music background I didn't know about, but um, you, you definitely got, got a lot of skills. So we, we have a pretty looking logo that was developed by a very good graphic artist. Mm -hmm. But they, they said, oh, we have a brand. And I said, wait a minute. No, we don't. And um, and so we have the beginning of a brand. Okay. And we've got a strategy and um, you and I are yet to talk about what that is and how, how we manifest it. And we do, we're building, um, we're building audiences, plural. Good. Concert in, in three days hmm, is where I'm conducting Russell is, okay. um, is going to represent the demographic of, and psychographic of Lynchburg because it'll have all of God's people under one roof. Uh, but but in order for us to have effective messaging, um, Juwan's is going to help help us form a marketing committee and develop our brand. So in a, in an organization like ours, who we have a pretty picture, we're doing stuff, but we're not really attracting the attention that we deserve. 
how do you start the conversation about developing a brand? Because there's lots of components, the brand image, the brand promise, the brand identity, and so forth. Because there's, there's a lot of components of a brand. And sometimes people just want to shut down and say, it's too much to think about. But it's essential, I think, if we're going to crack the market we want. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, I, I think I want to, I think I'd like to start with the positioning, you know, like kind of where, um, what thought does the symphony have in everyone's mind? And, and um, what thought does that have in donors' minds? And how does that relate to uh, what's been done, as well as some ideas of what we can do? Try to bridge that gap. I think I, as I'm, as I'm listening, and continuing to, to observe as well as talk with others that, that love and have attended other um, symphonies, I'm thinking that's where there's a gap is uh, what they want, what we want to deliver, what the community views and, and the direction that everyone would like to take things in. So it's a question of finding out what's important to each different audience and uh, so how much does Brandon have to do with uh, actually finding out who your audience is? In other words, what's the, what's the proper order? Does the brand come first or does the demographic you're going after come first? Uh, to me, you need to know your demographic and, and we can kind of build the brand around that. Uh, and, and also, you know, like marketing, and branding, they're, they're kind of, they have similarities that overlap, but, you know, marketing kind of comes later, if you, if you ask me. Let's, let's get the brand in place. Uh, let's, un let's understand the demographic first, then let's put the brand in place. Now that the brand is in place, let's, uh, now we know who we're marketing to, and it will also give us some goals and some numbers uh, to, to to pinpoint and look forward to. Otherwise, I think we're kind of shooting in the dark. And, and um, I, I definitely don't, I don't want to do that, or, or nor do I want to have um, my clients feeling that we're kind of feeling around for an answer. I like us to know like, hey, you know, we're, we're aiming for, you know, uh, a 90% return or an 80% return. And we're able to pinpoint that and, and say, hey, we hit the mark, we did great. Or, ooh, we, we missed the mark, but here's why we missed the mark. Um, I think those things are vital. So the, the order matters to me. And, and I think you're, you're building a foundation and then you're adding on the different rooms to it. So mm -hmm. you, you, you have referred to, um, you want to make sure that the donors know what's going on. I do believe that, uh, you know, in the case of the symphony, we're selling event tickets. And the 40 to 50% of our budget comes from ticket sales. Okay. And, Two years ago, we were in a bigger hall because the one we're in was being re 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 renovated. Uh -huh. um, um, and this hall seated 2,000 and we had 300 people and, and the board was saying, well, why don't people come? Well, we weren't doing diddly of a good job. Um, it actually is in the, in the, uh, in the words of a co-publisher of Nonprofit Performance Magazine, Jeff McGee, so we suck at that. Suck is halfway to success. <laughs> so we uh, we really didn't. We ran a couple of print ads, but it really was there was no targeted client for it, and so we just kind of splattered a few things. Now, last year this concert we sold out. We're we're um, inches away from being sold out for Friday's performance. Great, be eight hundred and thirty tickets. So um, that's all this hall will hold. And it's, it's, there's an energy that it's full. It, it helps us meet our budget. But also, those are people that are coming with a specific expectation. So having a brand is what you build your marketing around. So you don't do your marketing program until you have your strategy and your brand put together. And then mm -hmm. parallel to that is your development plan where you're going to raise grant money, sponsor money, donor money, and all of that in addition cool. to the other things. And I think there's a synergy with all of these as they work together. So go back to how would you encourage a leader in the board, in the staff, anywhere in the organization that they really realize that we're, we're not reaching the people we want and we've got to sit down and think about our brand. Where's the starting place and how would you encourage them to begin this conversation? 
um, I think it, I think that goes back to creating that brand voice, that that persona that I talked about at the beginning. Um, let's take a step back and and see what that person looks like and sounds like and feels like. And I, and I think from there we can then ask the big question: Does this individual reflect who's coming through our door? Does it reflect um, a demographic or an audience that we would like to focus on that we don't have? Um, it gives us the opportunity to ask some yes and no questions and to kind of check the, the temperature of our efforts. And um, I think without that, then we're back to where we say where we're kind of feeling in the dark, where we're, we're happy about, um, you know, we're happy about the success and, and, and the, the growth is great. I love to hear that. Um, but if we want to go in a fresh direction or not even a fresh, but just continue to expand on that, I think being able to know um, who, what our persona is, what is the symphony's persona, so that we can give that to the community is the way to go. That's the starting point. Hmm. Some organizations might approach you and say, okay, well, we don't really know who our, our target audience is or who's coming through the door. What are some things that some organizations have access to that they might not be aware of that can help start that process of defining that audience more specifically? Honestly, uh, it's free and people don't really utilize it for all it's worth is social media. Like being able to tap into Instagram, for example, um, or, or being able to tap into Facebook. These things have such amazing analytics that are connected to them. Um, that we can pinpoint demographic, we can, you know, we're talking age, sex, we can deal with the actual um, community or area where uh, your, your, your audience is coming from. Um, for example, some of the work that I've done with uh, a local base, our local baseball team here, uh, well, minor league team here, mm -hmm. we were able to pinpoint um, that a lot of the community was actually about 35 years old and was female. Um, and us finding that out, well, that changed the way that we did our promotions. It changed the way that the materials looked that went out. Uh, and it helped us increase our walk up to 40%. It was a 40% increase just from changing those things. But it wasn't until we looked at the analytics um, and begin to and begin to find out that that personality that was coming into the park was more female than male, that we were able to make that adjustment. Yeah, Facebook does have very good uh, demographics. There are also some tools that uh, that Google gives people access to. Mm. Uh, you make use of those and. Uh, uh, do many people have those things plugged into their website and how easy or difficult is it to, to get those things plugged in so that you can begin to gather the information you need? Um, most of the Google Analytics is it's as simple as just a line of code. Uh, it's just knowing where to put it. Uh, there, there are other um, analytics that we can run if you're using, for example, Facebook ads. Uh, there's a lot of information that we can pull from those and setting, setting that up is a little more tricky. Um, but once that information is in place, you can utilize it in, a, in an amazing way um, and, and create a lot, of, a lot of avenues for you to gain information that you, know, you can use for years and years to come. So that, that would be the, info, the direction that I would focus on or push anyone into is really utilizing your social media, getting your information out to those audiences so you can begin to get back, um, you know, who's talking, who's connecting with you. Um, and, and it'll give you a great ballpark figure, or, or at least it'll give you, if, if not a ballpark, it'll give you a good place to start. And, um, and, and that's, that's something that I would recommend. What would be a realistic time frame for a, a, a nonprofit or organization to zero in uh, on, uh, on the key elements of their audience? At earliest, you're looking at about three to four months. Um, and, and that's just enough for, for you to be able to run a couple of tests um, and, and, and put some feelers out and, and see the responses that you're getting. 
um, maybe your audience doesn't respond to Q&A. Uh, so you, if you're asking questions and you don't see you're getting those kind of res responses that you want, switch it up. See if, uh, see if it's something that's more so based around uh, leaving, uh, leaving imagery. Uh, you know, if I, if I post a picture, leave a caption, um, does, that, does that invoke more uh, likes? Does that invoke more comments? Does that invoke more engagement than me writing the questions out? So uh, do a couple of feelers, see what works for your demographic, and then take all of that and keep it in mind going forward. So that's why I say give it about three to four months at the earliest. Um, of course, the longer you go, the more information that you have, and then the more sound decisions you can make. So I would yet venture to guess, and you can tell me if I'm off base or close, but the, the effectiveness of your reach depends on where your audience is, and there are a lot of different tools. Uh, the best tool uh, would probably, there's a fit for an audience and a fit for an organization, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the tools to use how do you help uh, help them help an organization make a determination uh what sorts of things would be best to try for your initial tests oh uh, well that once again goes back to that personality if um if we see that from forming the personality for example let's say uh the the their vo their voice is a a friendly uh expressive uh, style of person, then okay, we're 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 probably going to lean more towards using Instagram and telling your story through pictures. If you're if you're more of a of a driven, results based, um, very very A type by the book, we may actually lean towards LinkedIn and using that that platform of social media to connect with your audience. But it it all comes down and it's based upon that. Uh, that that test that we put together to to see what kind of persona it is in the first place. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, but there are just a mountain of tools out there, and so by in that discovery session, you you probably hone in on good starting places for people to start. Yes. Uh, yeah. Building building that. Yeah. A lot of people may think that. Process of building the brand is difficult. Uh, is that the case, or is it more a case of actually just taking the time with a focused effort and a strategy? It it's not difficult, but it can be time consuming. Um, and I, I think a lot of people try to rush the process because they want to get to see a result. And and you know, it, it's kind of like. Um, you know, we want the beach body, but we don't want to go to the gym. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah, so. well, I worked out once that didn't work. My stuff, <laughs> yeah. right. I would sit there for 20 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I did sit ups this week and then I, I ate a steak. So I, I tried, <laughs> you know. But uh, but yeah, but I I think that's um that's a lot of the the cases that I tend to to see, is that these individuals or 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 agencies they they want they want the big results they want the wow but they they don't want to take the time and so it's that's a bit of a hur of a hurdle to jump, um, but getting everyone to kind of slow down to to you know go through the process and trust the process then we're able to get to the results that they really want. And I imagine that process is extended when you're attempting to do as much of this as possible organically due yes. to the budget constraints. Yeah, yeah. It, or the, we're always working within the budget. We're always working within, um, you know, the, the constraints that they give us. Uh, also, we're, 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 we're always trying to also push um, nonprofits to to get their to get their brand beyond being a tool that's just used for fundraising, and we understand the importance of fundraising. But there's there's so many other uh, um, platforms that that we're able to tackle. So let's try to build something that's well rounded as opposed to kind of one dimensional. I think a lot of it revolves around storytelling and, and making connections and, and 
uh, people don't necessarily give. They give to causes, they give to other people. So okay. as a general rule, are there some tools that you find are more effective for storytelling than others? Oh man, that's a good question. From, for, for me, I think video is, uh, is a huge avenue. Um, and, and, uh, and of course, you know, content, content is king. So mixing video with really strong content, um, I think that's the best way to kind of get the story out. And um, it allows for uh, strong narratives to take place. You know, we can get stories down to 60 seconds. Um, so being able to, to kind of bounce between that and, and the content itself, I think that's really a strong way to go. So it makes me, makes me wonder, um, so, so is there a, a mind shift, mind shift um, that needs to happen with leaders in order to fully, you know, you said a while back, sometimes we're too close to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I help other organizations, other leaders build their strategy. You think I can do it for myself? No. Uh, it's, it's just, I'm in the middle of it. And it, it's just all, I, I get it. And I tell people, they go, what? Um, and, and so, how do we have a change in mindset? Because we're really clear on what we're doing and we want to blame other people for not getting it. So how do you have this conversation with somebody? I mean, there's sure, I'm sure there's people that want you to do your magic, but you, you can't help them. So you have to turn them down because they want, they're not teachable. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so um, what's the mindset shift that needs to happen? Um, I think the big, component that needs to be shifted is uh, control. Uh, the, the, the feeling that we have to be in control of every component in order for it to be great. I, I think if we can begin to back away from that and, and, and the relinquishing of control, uh, if, if, we can, if we can wrap our mind around that component, I think everything else begins to fall into place. So, so when you, because as a leader, um, you, you're looking at, you know, you're looking at data, you're looking at your team, you're looking at, of course, whatever uh, product or goal it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and, and you often feel like you have to be in control of all these different components um, in order for them to be successful. Uh, so I think if, I think if you're able to take that step back and say, okay, I can let someone else take the reins and trust that they're going to get me to where I want to be, then the results will be yielded. But that's the, that's the part that I, I, I see so many people struggle with. Now there, there are people that are very good at creating an identity. Like I noticed behind you, there's an Irving Penn picture with a like of the famous picture and then the Ouija picture of the infrared picture in the theater um, oh. the big behind you. I don't know if those are physical pieces, but the, the glasses, that's a famous photographer called Ouija, Arthur Felix, uh -huh. who had two cameras, one with a wide angle, one with a slight telephoto, two Leicas. He did everything with two cameras and two lenses, which he never, ever changed, which was quite remarkable. Uh -huh. But it was, there were signature pictures, which um, his work, represented who we are. Now, you're, you're getting on board with the Lynchburg Symphony, and we've got a new conductor this year, and we're shaping the artistic content. And it's a new day. So it's really important for us to get our act together now and, and be sure that people know who we are, because they, they might show up by accident, but we really need to attract the people who want to come. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing pretty good, but it's Christmas. It's at a great theater. And I'm conducting. What more could they ask for? <laughs> so we got it. We got, you know, we got the, the, the choir that opened the theater after, it, you know, in last year, 60 years, it was closed. It never had been integrated. So this choir is singing for us. So they're singing some, some traditional spirituals of the season. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then we got a children's choir and then we got this mixed choir of, community leaders that I've been leading. And then we got our, our, our home based symphony, one of our local soloists. So we, we've really packed the, the stars on stage. 
So mm -hmm. that's a draw. But but people are coming to this concert because it's a special celebration for them. Mm -hmm. We can't sell that 11 other months of the year. And mm -hmm. so for us to be able to say, this represents the Lynchburg Symphony or this represents the, uh, the food bank, this represents the Salvation Army, this represents the Community Foundation. I think there's lots of misconceptions out there about the work of nonprofit. I'm, I'm not catching any of that, Hugh. I, I lost you for a second. Yeah, I, I did as well. Ah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I guess there's a little audio uh, uh, thing going on with him there. But, yeah. So I, I think the gist of what he's, he's, uh, he's addressing is uh, that sort of year-round presence. And how important is that year-round presence to the branding? And how do you help people capture that so that uh, they can work at having their brand put them top of mind for the work they're doing? Um, I, I think a, a way that I would recommend um, is, is actually creating uh, brand ambassadors. Um, let, let, let's get a local, you know, let's get a local feel, a, a group of individuals Their faces in the community, and and also if we can get them of varying ages, that would really be great. Um, but let's let them do some of the lifting for us, and also speak for us. And that's something that we can continue on beyond the holiday season. Um, that they, you know, we can have them uh, strategically placed, or if the demographic is broad enough, you know, having them speak online or leave uh, once again these uh, influential messages on social media. Um, the the tying in begins to happen that we're looking for. So, what's the best way to create sort of a dialogue or a regular type of engagement? Are, are there are there some ways to do that that are more effective than others, or is that something that you you find out as you uh, as you work through the information that you have and start establishing? relationships with your current demographic and, and so forth yeah it's it's, it's something where the, the it varies uh it's it's and and i try to tell everyone you know everyone we work with that you know this the process is never cookie cutter but it there's a lot of things that will overlap so what works for one organization may not necessarily work for another um, of course, there's trends, there's things, there's, there's things that you see will be duplicated, but it's, it's never a cookie cutter process. Yeah. So, yeah, what, what's, the, what's the best way to find out what works for a particular organization? Um, you can kind of, uh, you can look at what they already have done um, and see that track record. You know, you, if you have a lot of the good things working, there's no need to invent the wheel, to reinvent the wheel. Um, but if you, there's areas that, that are new that you're looking to get into, then that's where I say that understanding that voice and having that, uh, that brand persona in place becomes very vital. So, um, and as well as also, like I said, with the, the brand ambassadors, creating these avenues, multiple avenues um, that, that lead back to your industry or lead back to your business, that's, that's what you want. Talk a little bit about some of the things that help to make a brand ambassador effective, as you will. Uh, what are some of the skills what are, that, uh, that they need to bring to the table? Uh, first and foremost, uh, an audience. They have to have their own audience, their own level of influence among, among their groups. These are the kind of individuals where if they wore a sweater, they have anywhere between 200 and 800 people that are happy to see them in the sweater. Uh, you know, that they come with an audience, they're likable. Um, they, they push the, the letter, but not to the point where they're abrasive. 
so that's kind of some of the things that you want to have in play. Uh, you know, if it's if it's a physical product, then um, having someone that that is athletic. If it's a if it's an athletic piece, if it's something art based, then having individuals that are well known and respected in the art community that are connected. Um, that's kind of a, a great tool to have as far as being an ambassador. Give us an example of somebody you work with. Can you hear me now, Russell? Uh, yes. I think it, uh, yeah. There we go. You're lucky you didn't hear the age thing. I was talking in my mind. <laughs> I, think, I think God cut my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what happened. I'll explain that to you after. <laughs> We're almost through 2018. He can do this. He can do this. 2019. That's yeah. Yeah. Another year getting, you know, you get older, it goes faster. I can remember when Russell didn't have, I, well, I remember when he had hair, but it was dark hair. It wasn't gray like it is now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we've introduced a lot of topics here. So I guess what I'm thinking is, is encouraging an organization to have the discipline to go through the steps. You know, you do a strategy and then you you integrate the strategy to performance. It's not just a piece of paper. You develop your brand, then you, you integrate that with the strategy, and then you build a marketing program to 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 expose your brand and your brand promise and to, to connect with people. So over a period of time, this doesn't happen overnight, but it doesn't take forever either. So do you recommend that that nonprofit boards huddle and do like a power weekend and, and put their thinking cap on and create the documents or do you, do you think that, or do you suggest they do it in phases? How, what's most effective in your book doing the strategy, the marketing plan and the brand and the, the whole brand creation? Um, I'm a huge fan of, of, of kind of like the power weekends where, where we come together and then we're able to, you know, to kind of block off a large chunk of time and we're going to sit here and, and move through it. Um, it doesn't mean that it all gets done, but we can accomplish a lot in those sessions. So maybe if we had uh, three of those sessions broken up over, you know, like maybe once a month, um, you know, we could knock the whole process out. We're expediting so much of the work. Um, of course, some of those, some of it can't happen all at once because we have to take data back and crunch those numbers and, and, and see the result um, of, of, of what we want to see happen. So, you know, maybe we, maybe we get the information together and now we're going to uh, uh, present it during an event. And now we're going to get the information back from that event. And then based on that, when we meet the next time, we know what we need to tweak, what we don't need to tweak, what seem to work really well as well as we can get feedback from everyone. So um, it's, it's definitely a, it's, it's a group effort. So it's not something that, you know, I would say, oh, it's not a one and done, but it's definitely, you know, it may be a two part process, three part if it's large enough. Um, but for, a, you know, for a nonprofit, probably a, a two part process. And, and it's, it's all hands on deck. So um... yeah, yes. People, there's a, there's a synergy in people coming together and pooling their ideas and pooling their energy. Because in my world, the, the planners and the doers are the same people. Yes, most often. And, and, and too often, um, um, a leader says, I'm going to do it for him and just give it to him. Well, he's just cut them off at the knees. They're not going to do anything because it's not their plan. Now, talk about the people side of the brand. Now we've um, we've seen brand slaughter. My friend David Corbin was on a year or so ago, and he he's got a book called Brand Slaughter, where somebody absolutely destroys the brand. And you know, I know there was there was big brand destruction for um, an airline um, that they had somebody that dragged somebody off a plane. You know, I won't say the airline's name, but the initials are United. And there was a lot of there was a lot of brand damage for that. I mean, they're still in business and all of that, but mm -hmm. things like that. People represent your brand, and we just want to invite anybody onto the board, anybody volunteer, and anybody to run a committee. Now, I just didn't haphazardly invite you. I'd known you for a while. I know your reputation, and I know the value that you bring before I even open my mouth. 
um, and you and I had had time to build a relationship. So talk about the um, the relationship that the volunteers, the board members, the constituents have in a nonprofit, and how that that relationship manifests in the brand, the brand image. They are part of the brand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, every individual is it's like a cog within a watch. So whether some of the cogs are large or some of the cogs are small, each part is, each component is needed. And when you sub out a cog, you have to find one that, that kind of fits, um, you know, that, that, that replacement piece. It doesn't necessarily need to be the same, but it needs to be able to work within the rest of the watch. So for, for members of a board or for individuals that are on a board, um, personalities matter. Uh, and, and you want, you want, you know, you don't have to have everyone have the same idea, but, uh, there should be a similar ideology that kind of weaves everyone together. Uh, you know, for the symphony, it should be, I would say a love of music, um, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we all like Chopin or Bach, but it does mean that we all have an appreciation of music itself. And that should be a commonality that we can connect on at the end of the day. So uh, the the individual matters, the the people matter, um, and and the way that we utilize them, of course, that also matters. Yeah, a lot of us um, think we're doing it, but I, is there is there board training relevant to how to do all of this, and then how how to be representatives of the brand? Because I'm sure there's there's brand identity statements and brand promise statements. When you come to symphony concert, you're going to experience really fine quality music in various styles, different genres and different locations. There's something that appeals to everybody in Lynchburg. Mm-hmm. So our commitment is that you know, we do a lot of that in this Christmas program, but uh, the next program is going to be Broadway. And we're not doing any Broadway this time. We did Beethoven last time, and then the next one is going to be uh, Bach. And, and that's a little nar- narrower demographic, but likewise, record labels still sell a lot of broad music. So there's there's a different audience for each one of these. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's beautiful because then that that goes back to the the example of the cog. Like each each component is a little bit different, and that's okay. Um, every board member is a little bit different, and that's okay. And the thing that weaves them together is that that appreciation of the music and what also helps weave them together is when you have uh, a great executive director when you have someone that that's overseeing uh, everything that's happening and they're able to 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 pull the intricacies out of these individuals and make them feel wanted and appreciated uh, for the time that they're giving so it's there's so many different little components that's at place um that someone like me that comes in from the branding and the marketing side, you know, I'm looking at all those pieces and that's included and should be included when we talk about the identity of the brand. You have to, you also have to include the board. So. What's well, essential? It's essential, isn't it? What's the best way to kind of communicate that or train people to, com- to, uh, can you repeat that, Hugh? I think we have a big delay in the sound. I was uh, I was just piggybacking on his last question, but go ahead with your Russell, please. Uh, okay, okay, uh, yeah, I, I lost you very very briefly there. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in bringing the message together. Is there a process for training folks to so that everybody's singing off the same sheet of music in terms of articulating that brand? Would it be the same for volunteers or staff or different? Or how do you bring that all together so that uh, everyone's uh, communicating that message um, once you that's a, That's actually a part of our strategy session that we do. We walk you through a series of questions, um, which which allow you to, you know, kind of uh, funnel that thought into a single sentence. 
Um, and so by the end of the session, we've created an individual. We also have a statement or positioning that we're going to take. And all of these are like one word, not one word, sorry, one or two sentences um, that the board itself then gets to agree on. So now we're looking back and we're able to say, okay, we as a board are saying that we are A, B, and C. Do we agree with that as a board? And maybe we do and maybe we don't. And if we don't, then we work back through certain components of the process until we all have that agreement, but we're able to walk out on the same page. So there is a little bit of um, teaching that's involved. It's, it's not long, it's painless. <laughs> it's just a part of the process that we work through. And um, as he would talk about, you know, having that in a power session where maybe you, you know, you spent a couple hours on a Saturday working that out. Um, but then you get to leave uh, knowing exactly where you stand and you actually have direction when moving forward. And that goes back to uh, kind of when we first started the conversation. And, and I was saying that there are, you know, there's almost like an identity crisis that's taking place. So by the end of these sessions that we hold, that identity should be clear. It should be um, something that, that's no, you know, that, that we understand who you are and what you're about or what the organization is about. And it's malleable for everyone there. Is there a rhythm or a frequency where you check in to look at how effectively, once you've got that message honed in and everybody in the organization is clear on it, uh, checking to make sure that it's being delivered uh, in a way that resonates with the audience. How frequently do you check that to see uh, if the audience is, so to speak, on the same page to make adjustments? That, we do that on a monthly basis. Um, so every 30, 31 days, we like to check back in, especially after events. Um, that's kind of where we get to use that litmus test and see, okay, are we in alignment with the position that we took? Are we off? Do we need to change the position altogether? That's always also um, an avenue that we can take. I, I think sometimes I see uh, agencies that are kind of scared to back up and, and say, okay, that did not work. Let's all agree that it didn't work. Let's go back and do something completely different. And that's that's something that I don't mind doing. Uh, I'm, I'm far more concerned with being successful than saying that I was, you know, I'd rather say I was wrong and, and let's back up and get it right than to let's forge ahead, so. And what are some of the best metrics, uh, you know, to look at to see how effective your messaging is? Uh, once again, in, um, is social media would be engagement. Um, if it's an event, then it would be the, the, the turnout or the walk up. Um, I, what I love best is when we have a great event and then that event transfers over the next two to three days into an online conversation. Pictures are posted, hashtags are used. We see examples of um, people sharing photos and, and almost wanting to relive the event. Uh, we've had that a couple times. So I love, I love when I can see that. That's a huge gauge for us and lets us know that we're doing well. Well, you've given us um, um, ample and plus more. You've given us an incredible amount of stuff. Think about it, Joanza. Um, and it's a lot of process. Oh, thank you. Now, you, um, you live and work in Lynchburg, Virginia. We're in the same, we're in the same city, Russell. It's big enough for both of us. But um, but you work with people anywhere. <laughs> there we are. Isn't that great? You, uh, you you probably work with people anywhere, don't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it doesn't have to be in Lynchburg. Um, we we uh, help. We've helped out people in California. Uh, we have a couple clients in Chicago and in Florida. So it's you know wherever we can get in and make a difference. Juwanza, um, um website is um, blackwaterbranding.net, black, B-L-A-C-K, waterbranding.net in Lynchburg, Virginia. And he's got quite a team surrounding him. And you're the, you're the brilliance behind the vision and you've got a team behind you. And uh, um, I want to, you to think a minute about a, a parting thought you'd like to leave with people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a sponsor message real quick. 
and then I'm going to let you have have a have a go. At what would you like the people to think about? What tip would you like to give them, or what challenge would you like to give them as your last word here? And then Russell will close out this really good interview. We're in our fifth year now doing these, Johnson. So oh, that's our, awesome. Our sponsor, one of our sponsors for for Center Vision Leadership Foundation, is Word Sprint. Word Sprint is a print house, but they're really a mail house. But really, it's a marketing agency. And so we, um, uh, we as Intervision, mail our magazine, Nonprofit Performance 360 magazine, and one of our most recent copies is all about branding. And there's a, a copy, I um, mean, an article in there by today's guest, Juan Hall. You can read that magazine at nonprofitperformance.org, nonprofitperformance.org. You can read that edition and all the previous editions of Nonprofit Performance. You can look at this interview and all of the others on the nonprofitexchange.org. This is called the Nonprofit Exchange, where we exchange ideas. You can also find it um, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, WordSpread helps us stay at, at, in the forefront of people that, that support us. Uh, people that are donors, people that attend events, people that, that should be joining our online community for community builders, where nonprofit leaders build their skills, build their, de- their teams, and build their income. It's a systematic process. Build your strategy, integrate that into performance. Create your brand, make sure that manifests through everything that you're going to do. So Word Sprint's um, pattern is the right message, 30%. 30% is the right person. You got to target who it goes to, and 30% is the right rhythm. So it's top of mind marketing, the right person, the right message, the right rhythm. And then 10% of it is the appearance. Um, we don't want to look like we're wasting people's money with fancy designs. We need a professional, well done design, like uh, probably Joanza could do up for you. We need to, to look professional and it needs to be representative of our brand. But staying in touch with this is what's happened as a result of your support. Um, then at the end of the year, we ask for money if we've stayed in touch with our members. So Word Sprint, like fast, wordsprint.com. Uh, Bill Gilmer and his team will be glad to consult with you on how his program will help Retain your donors, grow your donors, and grow your donor platform over time. Wordsprint.com is a proud sponsor for five years of Center Vision Leadership Foundation. So, Joanza, as we close out this really helpful interview, what thought or challenge or tip would you like to leave people with today? Uh, I'd like to leave them with a challenge. Uh, and that challenge is, is to be able to tell your origin story clearly and concisely. That would make a massive difference in launching your brand. We are here every week on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on the Nonprofit Exchange. We're coming up on holiday season. We'd like to thank every one of you who's come in to support us over the 2019. You've made it a great year for us, and we look forward to journeying through 2020 with you. Uh, Please join the community. When you come on to our website, there's a big blue button that says join now. Come in, uh, converse with us. We are here every week. Uh, There's all sorts of information and tools at that website, and uh, you can find out ways to connect with us and learn. So this is Russell Dennis signing off, thanking all of you, wishing you the best of holiday seasons here at the Nonprofit Exchange, and we will be here next week at this same time. Thank you for all that you do.